Hi, my name is Bruce Isaacs. I'm an academic working in film studies at the University of Sydney. Over the next week, I'm going to be looking at five iconic sequences in the cinema of Martin Scorsese, one each day. You don't make up for your sins in the church. You do it in the streets. You do it at home. The rest is bullshit and you know it. So for today's sequence, we're going to go a few years ahead to what is considered now certainly Scorsese's early masterpiece, Mean Streets from 1973. I'm going to pause at this point to give you a little bit of background because I want to move us from Who Said Knocking At My Door to something like five years later. Now Scorsese is something of a known filmmaker and Mean Streets, I think, is going to be his signature work of this period of his career. Mean Streets is going to open a number of doors for him. And there are so many things we take from Mean Streets in setting up what comes later in Scorsese's career. I talked about the tension between a commitment to an American Hollywood cinema and an art house European cinema. And we see that writ large over who's that knocking at my door. I think we see it in such interesting and provocative ways throughout that sequence. So let me tell you a brief story about Mean Streets. From Who's That Knocking At My Door, Scorsese gets involved with American International Pictures, which is the group that's headed by Roger Corman. I don't know if you know any of his movies. Uh, He's the guy that's, I suppose, um, often thought responsible for the American B-grade cinema. Uh, he's made some of the great horror films, the bikini films, the biker films, etc. And if you're into that kind of thing, you know, Corman is as valuable to American cinema as is Scorsese. So Scorsese, along with so many of his contemporaries, Peter Bogdanovich, for example, starts to work for Corman. Uh, and he gets this project to work on a film called Boxcar Bertha. And he makes a Depression-era movie that really plays as a kind of exploitation movie. Because that's the kind of stuff Corman did. So there's a wonderful story that's recounted in the publication Scorsese on Scorsese. You can grab this. It's the uh, Faber set of volumes uh, of of filmmakers speaking about their own work. And the account goes something like this, that Scorsese, who had been so influenced by John Cassavetes, he invites Cassavetes over to watch an early print of Boxcar Bertha, the film he had just made with American International Pictures. So they watch it, and they get to the end. And apparently the story goes that Cassavetes turned to Scorsese and said, Marty, it's a very good movie, but don't ever make a movie like that again. I think that is such a revealing comment. I don't know that it's the truth, but I think within that sort of anecdotal, apocryphal history, we get something of the truth that would become Mean Streets. Cassavetes is essentially saying that cinema should be truthful. It should be authentic, it should be realistic, and it should demonstrate a commitment to your own history. And I suppose Cassavetes was also saying that Scorsese had, in a sense, sold out by going to American International Pictures and making a movie like Boxcar Bertha. I mean, I quite like Boxcar Bertha, so I'm not sure that I agree with the position, but the point is, it therefore makes sense that from Boxcar Bertha, we go to this incredibly... Uh, 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 authentic, deeply personal account of life on the streets. And Scorsese is going to call this Mean Streets. I'm going to play the opening credit sequence. Uh, I, I, I thought over this before uh, putting this together and, and, and wondered about what were my favorite credit sequences. And this would certainly be one of them. You know, I can think of, of, of several others. Maybe Finch's credits to Seven is, is a personal favorite as well. But have a look at what Scorsese is going to do to frame Mean Streets and to continue that tension between a European art cinema and a burgeoning uh, uh, American art house cinema that he's going to be central in developing. You don't make up for your sins in the church. You do it in the streets. You do it at home. The rest is bullshit and you know it. All right, so we move from the somewhat, I think, staged, choreographed formalism of who's that knocking on my door, and now we get something far more intense, far more naturalistic. The handheld camera work, the claustrophobia of his bedroom, 
we get this uh, uh, subjective shot. This is Charlie now looking at himself in the mirror and contemplating his own life. New York City streets. Right, we have to take that back. In, in the annals of Scorsese's cinema, it's simply too important to have a look at once. Uh, I'm going to look at a couple of things here. Have a look at what he's going to do with the cutting, and then listen to the way the music is going to come in, and I guess I want to suggest that the music is going to provide its own rhythm to the image. And I, and I mean that quite seriously that the images we're going to look at now seem to me to be animated by a kind of rhythm brought by a very popular song of that period. first thing we notice is this gradual movement onto the bed. But Scorsese is not simply going to let Charlie relax himself onto the bed. He's going to cut three times. And these cuts are highly visible. They're highly expressive. They probably strike you as strange. They're called jump cuts uh, in, in, in film analysis. And what a jump cut is, very basically, is that it's a cut like any other, but because the cut to the second image, uh, it shows us an image that's quite similar to the first image, we look at it as some kind of strange aberration. It doesn't appear to be a cut that was intended, and in fact looks like an accident. It looks like a mistake. The reason I'm laboring this point about the jump cut is because the jump cut at this point in American cinema and amongst the great new Hollywood filmmakers who prided themselves on their film history, the cut had become a symbol of a kind of rebellion against realism and against the mainstream of Hollywood cinema of the time. The jump cut comes from, most famously I suppose, uh, the work of Jean-Luc Godard. And if you've seen a movie called Breathless from its early 1960, uh, Goddard is going to jump cut throughout that movie. If you watch that film, the experience is, is, is really disconcerting because you're going to see a number of cuts that literally look as if somebody's made a mistake in the editing room. That mistake is, in fact, going to become one of the great symbols of artistic expression in art house cinema in France. Scorsese knows this. He's watched his Goddard. He's spent probably a decade studying these films. And so what he's going to give us at this moment is his own expression of the jump cut. This is, I guess I want to call it an American jump cut because we're going to see three cuts that are put together in such a way that we can clearly see they appear to be uh, mistakes, they appear to be aberrations in the cutting room, but they're entirely intended. They're also cut to Be My Baby by the Renettes. This is an iconic song in pop music in America. Um, it's a song that's also credited with defining a particular kind of pop song aesthetic that informed you know, the Beach Boys, the Beatles, etc. Um, there's a story that suggests that Brian Wilson, you know, the, the great singer-songwriter of the, of the Beach Boys, was obsessed with this song. So this is a very early example year of what is going to be thought to be one of Scorsese's greatest steady contributions to cinema, the use of the popular soundtrack. This is going to be a large theme in all of Scorsese's work. Uh, you can consider so many examples of this. Uh, think about Goodfellas, the opening, the use of the soundtrack, um, Casino. Uh, you've got so many examples of sequences that seem to be cut against popular songs. 
we've got here a very personal domestic space of the family of the individual and a history that we're watching an italian american history but cut over that is also an american pop culture sensibility again it's scorsese drawing on so many currents in american film of the time and fusing them with a vision and an aesthetic sensibility that to my mind just watching this now with you is quite astonishing i think it's it's really radical i think it's it's courageous so if we end this by going back to Cassavetes, Cassavetes telling Scorsese that cinema should be realistic, it should be truthful, and it should be about your personal life. I mean, this is what Cassavetes was committed to for most of his career, that an American cinema should be about the truth. Scorsese moves from Boxcar Bertha, a movie made by Corman's people at American International Pictures, and he takes us to something far more personal. We see his own family in this movie. It's therefore fitting that what we're watching is not a series of film images, but a series of home video images. And it's cinema year become the intimate personal space of the home video. We're looking at Scorsese's own past, in a sense. We're looking at his own memories. Uh, we're looking at the way that he developed as, uh, as an Italian American. This is gonna be the narrative that we're gonna pick up throughout Mean Streets, and it's a narrative that we're gonna take all the way through Taxi Driver, uh, Goodfellas, Casino. Uh, these locales constitute for Scorsese this life on the street, and it's a street that informs uh, his own identity as well as a particular kind of American cultural identity. He keeps all the experimentation of the French New Wave, of Italian neorealism he brings to it a popular American identity and fuses it into, again, this unique signature vision. Uh, and we'll pick that up with Taxi Driver in the next sequence. Four honorable men and Johnny. Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with me, my friend. I'm feeling fine. Keep your mouth shut. We're not gonna pay. We're not paying. No, we, well, why? We just said we were gonna have a drink. That and thing. we don't pay mooks. What's a mook? A mook? What's a mook? I don't know. What's a mook? Oh, my God.